I'm Lister Velt Middleton. Welcome to For the People. Except for the brief period of Alex Haley's Roots Mania, when African Americans searched county records to trace our African lineage back to a particular country in Africa, except for this brief period, we have been satisfied with the general designation of African American instead of Senegalese American or Ghanaian American. What were the historical and cultural forces that created acceptance of this continental designation? How long did enslaved Africans retain and practice African cultural forms? Has integrationist theory always enjoyed the level of apparent acceptance it currently enjoys among the black leadership? Just some of the questions we'll explore with Dr. Sterling Stuckey, author of Slave Culture, Nationalist Theory, and the Foundations of Black America. Dr. Stuckey is professor of history at Northwestern University. He has received fellowships from the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences and from the Smithsonian Institution. The book attempts to explain, above all, the process by which a variety of African peoples, Yorubas, Ibos, Ibibios, Akans, were somehow fashioned into a single people on the plantations of the South, especially in this country. Uh, it was long held that it was impossible to explore this question of, of African ethnicity in North America because there was an adequate documentation. Well, I think the book demonstrates that it is possible to do that, and in the book I attempt to show how many different African peoples were fashioned into a single people here in North America. Now, nationalist theory, what does that mean, nationalist? Within the context of, of, uh, of, of black uh, oppression in North America, nationalist theory refers to the means by which, according to certain black intellectuals especially, black people might be able to achieve their liberation. And nationalists hold this view in common, that it is the primary responsibility of black people themselves to liberate themselves. No one else can do that for them. No people oppressed at any time in human history has been liberated by another people. The, uh, the people who are oppressed must liberate themselves. Blacks must take primary responsibility for their own liberation. And true liberation for black people means that black people have to base their lives upon values that are proper to them, that they are comfortable with, values that are derived from their own experiences and traditions. It doesn't mean that, uh, that this must be done to the complete exclusion of the values of other people, but blacks can appropriate certain values from the larger society that they feel are are useful to them, but mainly, genuine liberation means being at home with oneself. You say, quote, slave ships were the first real incubators of slave unity across cultural line. Explain that, please. Well, that passage, that middle passage from the shores of, of, of West Africa in particular to, uh, to, to North America lasted sometimes up to a period of, of, of three months. During this period of time, uh, Africans, irrespective of their ethnic backgrounds, discovered that only black people were in chains on those ships, that whites were the ones who, who were in control on those ships, and f whites, through use of the whip, through use of chains, made it crystal clear to, to, to black people for the first time exactly how potent the force of race and racism could be in the lives of people. And they realized that in their own situation, Whites were the uh, oppressors and they were the oppressed and all other considerations of, of, of linguistic uh, barriers between them, of uh, religious differences among them became almost incidental uh, in, 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 in the face of that irreducible factor and force of racism. So, so, so color became critical to the African in relation to human relationships for the first time. In, in, in a permanent and ongoing sort of way as a result of that contact uh, with the slavers in that middle passage. It was clear that all of them were black and, and uh, the people who were controlling them were white. And thus, uh, uh, they recognized, uh, as I said, an irreducible bond of commonality grounded in, in race. Though race would not be the only factor that would lead them to uh, to determine their unity, they would discover other things, such as significant human values, that they, which they shared in common. They would discover these things after having arrived in North America. 
the King Buzzard story I, I thought was, was, was fascinating. I, um, would you tell us about the King Buzzard story and its meaning? Well, the King Buzzard uh, tale comes out of South Carolina, uh, out of this right sort here. of environment, right? <laughs> right. right. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a tale of ancient African vintage, though it uh, was being told uh, in this century, in the 1920s, and is, and is being told uh, in this period. We're talking about it now. It's a story about, um, it's in two parts. The first, it seems to me, is, is essentially symbolic, and the second is an artistic working out of the meaning of that symbolism. A group of, 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 of men are seated around a fire at night, uh, telling tales, as they so frequently did during the slave era. Uh, they're waiting for one of their colleagues to return from uh, the swamp area, his name is Tad, he returns, he's, he's wet and covered with yellow mud, and uh, one of them says, Tad, uh, where have you been? Uh, uh, you must have been enjoying yourself. He says, look at me, do I look like I've been enjoying myself? And he goes on to describe his experience in the swamp area. He says he had come upon a buzzard, and the buzzard, buzzard was, uh, was, was sailing all about him, flying all about him, and it looked as though that buzzard might that buzzard might vomit, vom as he said, vomit on me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there in the moonlight, where he's attempting to dodge and get away from that, that buzzard, uh, the, the buzzard does, does vomit, and he sees the leaves where the vomit falls and dries up on. And somehow he manages to get in the cane break and to get away from, uh, fr from the buzzard. And he te as, he, as, he, as he tells the, uh, the tale, uh, he's told by one of the other men seated around the fire, Tad, that, that wasn't no buzzard. My, my, my pa told me that way back in slavery time, way back in Africa, there'd been a nigga and he'd been a big nigga. He'd been the king of his tribe and he sold his people into slavery. He sold thousands of his people into slavery and when the white folks come back and said that was their last trip, so they knocked that nigga down and put chains on him and brought him to this country. And then he goes on to say, but when he died, there was no place in heaven for him and no place in hell. God didn't want him, certainly, and even the devil didn't want him. And his destiny, his fate, was to wander eternally across the face of the earth. His spirit would be restless throughout time. That was the, it seems to me, the ultimate African punishment was to, uh, in African terms, was for someone's spirit after their death to be restless forever. And on first reading that tale, one thinks that this, is, this tale has the quality of myth, of some great truth that would be applicable to any people at any given time in human history who'd, who'd suffered from oppression and been betrayed by their own. But one actually is able to determine the specific African origins of the tale, and one discovers that among the Igbo people, there is a notion that those who commit murders or those who commit uh, other terrible crimes or those who may have been unfortunate enough to have been born at least the Igbos believed this at one time in their, in their history, as twins might return to, from death as a buzzard. But particularly those who had committed an act of murder would return in the form of a buzzard, and their spirits would wander restlessly, restlessly throughout time. Uh -huh. So one is able to determine, and, and, and I should add that those people who have committed murder, according to the Igbos, uh, their spirits return to this earth, uh, from, when their spirits are in the other world, they are never able to look upon the face of God. Well, I think it's interesting that... Coming to the presence of God, and that, that is hell. That, that the buzzard eats the, the flesh of the dead. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm, I'm glad that you... I see uh -huh. you've been reading my book. <laughs> Rather closely at that. You're right. I, I failed to mention that, according to the Igbos, uh, that that is the only flesh that one eats have, after having committed a crime and having died is the flesh of the dead. So, too, in the case of uh, Tad's story, the king buzzard, that this buzzard only ate carrion, the flesh of the dead. So when you sell your people out, they were saying that you're eating. We got the story. <laughs> you, have you have committed the greatest, the most heinous crime imaginable. And therefore, you, you merit, you've, you've earned for yourself the most terrible punishment in African terms, and that is the restlessness, restlessness of your spirit. The majority of Africans that were brought here came from where? Well. Um, I think the, 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 the view today is that approximately one-third of them came from Congo, Angola, that area that has been sometimes referred to as the heart of Africa, the Congo, and then Angola immediately to its, uh, to its west. 
uh, a third approximately from Congo and Angola, a quarter of the Africans brought to North America from the area uh, of, uh, along the slave coast, and approximately 40% from the area of the, of the old Mali, old Mali Empire. And they came from these, these regions, uh, bringing their various uh, cultural practices with them. What is the ring shout? It is, um, it is a religious ceremony uh, directed uh, uh, toward the ancestors and the gods that uh, was the principal uh, religious ritual uh, in slavery in this country uh, that was uh, almost ubiquitous, almost everywhere one looked, one could, in the documentation one could find the ring shot or some variant of it being done during the slave era. It's characterized by counterclockwise uh, movement in a circle, usually, uh, a circle that begins uh, rather slowly and that becomes accelerated, the highest point of which is a state of possession that occurs to certain uh, of the celebrants who are involved in this ceremony. When you ceremony. say possession, what do you mean? Uh, in African terms, it, it meant that, uh, that an ancestor or a god would come in and actually take possession of the body that the, the celebrant would somehow uh, lose consciousness of what was taking place, and an ancestor or, uh, or a god would, 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 would camp, so to speak, in the body of, of, the, of the celebrant. So you can see that with, within the context of slavery, it was a very, it was a very um, revolutionary uh, religious ceremony if an African god of an African ancestor would inhabit the body of a slave this could be interpreted as being extremely subversive. The, the, the ring shout, as a matter of fact, uh, has been uh, and continues to be the principal uh, religious ceremony taking place in black America in this century and even down to the present time. I say that because it was within the context of the ring shout that the Negro spiritual was born. The people who moved in a counterclockwise direction as the uh, circle uh, inc increased its acceleration were the people who created the Negro spiritual is in that context that the spiritual was born. Uh, as they moved in the circle, they, they, they danced. And the form of dance that they, of dance, of sacred dance movement uh, that, uh, that, that they uh, uh, gave expression to uh, is the form of dance that black people and many uh, millions of white people for that matter too in different parts of the world uh, dance when they participate in jazz dance. Jazz dance was originally sacred dance and its most characteristic form was the form of dance that was done in that counterclockwise circle. Uh -huh. uh, the ring shout, therefore, has been very closely related to, to the evolution of jazz itself, jazz music. Uh, it is uh, apparent that, that jazz, as a form of music, received a tremendous boost from the, uh, po from the polyrhythmic activity that takes place in the ring shower where you may, might have the clapping of hands, the intricate beating out of patterns uh, on, on dirt or on wooden floors by the feet during the course of the ring shot, and then the rhythms that come from uh, the human voice, uh, oftentimes sounded in a percussive sort of way. So the ring shot has been the seat for the, for the creation of, of, of the Negro spiritual, for jazz dance, for jazz music. I contend for for gospel music as well, and of course that is the source of tap dancing in the black community. The control of those intricate uh, 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 figures uh, that, uh, that black people were able to manifest in their footwork uh, became the basis for the, for, the, for the invention, for the creation of, of tap dancing as well. You say this ring shout is the key to understanding how these different African groups achieved oneness. Would you, would you expound on that? Yes, yeah, an amazing thing. What, what one discovers is that the circle dance is, and that's what the Africans, how the Africans refer to it, seems to be pervasive in black Africa. Wherever one looks, one, one finds people dancing in a circle. But one also finds that in, that in a number of, of African cultures, in Central Africa and in West Africa, one finds uh, a circle dance being done almost invariably within an ancestral context, uh, during a burial ceremony or in an area where people are honoring the dead, one finds that this dance is, is a circle dance 
and one finds that it is, that it is done in a counterclockwise direction. Now, it, it's a very intricate and complex operation, especially in Central African Congo, Angola, the area from which I said approximately a third of the Africans who were enslaved in North America came, okay? It is very complex there. It, the counterclockwise movement there among the, and indeed some 40% of the people here in South Carolina in the period uh, of the last couple of decades of the slave trade came from Congo, Angola. Uh, Gullah Jack uh, and some of those people who were important to the Vizi conspiracy came from Congo, Angola. Well, in Congo, in the Congo region, the, uh, the sun in the southern hemisphere moves in a counterclockwise direction so that according to the Bakonga people, when uh, one dies, one's soul takes the orbit of the sun, uh -huh. so, that, so that they have what they call the four moments of the sun, dawn, uh, uh, noon, uh, sunset, and midnight. Uh, and they, these correspond to birth, to, to youth, and appear to greatest strength, to old age and waning power, and uh, to death. Now what one finds is that one, one has a counterclockwise movement of the circle dance in the key areas from which Africans were taken and brought here and enslaved, what one discovers is that, as I, as I suggested before, is that one, one finds a significant number of, of, of the Africans involved in, in using this, this dance in an ancestral context. They come together in North America, and in most cases, for the first time, discover that the dance movement is essentially the same, the song style is essentially the same, the purpose uh, for which the dance is being done, that is to show respect for the elders, for the ancestors of the gods, uh, the purpose is essentially the same. They discovered, therefore, a commonality that they did not know before. They found beneath them uh, the sacred ground of the dead, and upon that, uh, upon that ground, they found a certain unity that they hadn't known before. Across cultural barriers, despite linguistic differences, despite other differences, they noticed that the dance style was the same, the song style was the same, uh, the purpose of the ceremony to honor the dead was essentially the same. And they also discovered, therefore, that uh, their respect for the elders, for the old people, derived from the same source. It derived from the same source precisely because the elders being closest to being the ancestors, closest mm -hmm. to being the dead, yeah. are therefore do a great deal of respect because if they don't receive that respect, then bad things might befall the living. What was the white man's attitude about the ring shout? He somehow sensed that it had a religious purpose and he had a profound um, belief that the ring shout was a, was a tremendous obstacle to, to uh, inculcating um, certain spiritual values that the white people thought might help them make slaves better slaves. Uh, they, they, they saw it as, uh, as an obstacle to, to, to the conversion of slaves to Christianity, uh, in fact. As whites observed blacks dance in what apparently was a religious context for blacks, they wondered how on earth can there be dance uh, of, this, of, of any sort, really, uh, during a religious ceremony and thought that savage and primitive and, and barbaric. When they saw uh, the pelvic movement that is so essential to African uh, uh, life and ceremony being performed, they thought of that as somehow dirty, somehow nasty, because they associated it with, with sex in, uh, in, in a very dirty and nasty way. They did not see uh, the pelvic movements that, that Africans might, uh, mo motions that they might make during the ring shout as being, as the Africans saw them, part essential to the life process itself. Uh -huh. Sexuality is essential to the life process. Without that, all life ceases, as human life ceases. So, so they saw the, uh, the, the physical involvement of the Africans through sacred motion as a heathenish, primitive, barbaric thing, and uh, they were turned off by it. They thought it, they were appalled by it. They thought it was an awful kind of thing and had no place, from their point of view, in a religious ceremony. So they brought to it a profound sense of ignorance and a profound sense of fear. Now, what happened, therefore, was that in their attempts to, to, to stamp it out, uh, uh, it created uh, havoc certain times in black communities. They come upon blacks dancing in a circle. Blacks would immediately s stop dancing and simply rock to and fro, knowing that they weren't supposed to, 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 to quote, dance around these white people. And when whites would leave, 
they might then once again uh, do their dance. Whites have been known to approach blacks at camp meetings as late as the 1850s in places like Georgia and Louisiana and uh, enter, enter uh, a tent where blacks are doing the ring shout and only to have blacks cease doing the ring shout uh, in their presence and simply rock now, now, to and now you're, not a, you're not a psychologist, but, you know, is this, was this insecurity on their part because you said that they saw that all of this movement was, was uh, dirty? Where was the dirt? Was the, was the dirt in the, in the European mind or, or what? I mean... I, I think, it, I think it, it definitely must have been in the minds of the Europeans because this was, a, as I said, this was a sacred ceremony uh, to Africans, um, a ceremony that uh, was not at all unlike African fertility uh, rites and ceremonies uh, where you, you, you celebrate uh, fertility. Uh, to the European, uh, uh, what, what was in the European's mind, that dichotomy between body and, and soul, between reason and uh, emotion, between feeling and uh, rationality, this, this assumed dichotomy, whereas uh, the African had, had a conception of, uh, of body and soul that was more organic, that was more, uh, mm -hmm. that was, that was, it was of, uh, conception basically of a unity of mind and, uh, and of, physic, of the physical and the, and the spiritual in this context. Well, did, this, did this European have, at this time, more sexual hang-ups? than well, the African. I, 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 I don't want to venture upon that ground, but uh, very likely, if every time you saw someone, uh, most of the time when you saw someone dancing and the person's uh, bodily movements were, were different from those uh, uh, with which you were accustomed, it, it led you to, to think in terms of, of, of sex and uh, it led you to think in terms of uh, something sorted, then I would say that you have a problem. One of the concepts that you talk about in the, in the first chapter of the, of the book, the Kalunga line, I thought that was very, was very interesting. Would, would you uh, talk about that? Please? We return to the Bakonga here in, in Central Africa and their notion of the significance of the, of the African cross as being uh, a symbol uh, from which one can derive the circle, a symbol therefore that is associated with the full moments of the sun, with this counterclockwise movement of the sun. A symbol, therefore, that is associated with that counterclockwise African circle dance of when, they, when, when they do it. That horizontal bar of the cross, the horizontal bar of the cross, is referred to by the Bakonga as the Kalunga line. That is to say, as, the, uh, as a place where, symbolically speaking, God dwells, okay? It is, it, is, it is where one finds the Godhead represented as that horizontal bar. They also associate that with uh, bodies of water, with the surface of bodies of water. They associate it with a wilderness like this, which is to say that God might exist in a wilderness similar to this, or the term that they might use is a term like finda, a forest that represents the presence of God. It is a very significant uh, line, that horizontal line, with respect to certain kinds of water rights, water immersion rights, so that when one is dipped beneath the surface of that water, one has contact with the ancestors, which is uh, the reason they come up from that water shouting as they do. And yes. God. And, and with God, mm -hmm. and with God. It, uh, beneath the surface of that water is, is, uh, uh, is, is, is the means by which that water, once one is immersed, is the means by which one is cleansed of one's uh, wrongs and one Emer emerges from that water reborn, so to speak. Okay. If one has had contact with one's ancestors, that's just one of a, of, a, of, a, of a variety of ways in which one has a continuing interplay of the living and the dead in African religious, uh, in the African religious vision. Oh. Well, right here, this red spot here, which is hard spoon, mm -hmm. that's what we call it. And uh, the water was, although it's dry now, the water catches right up around here. And mm -hmm. it was good to baptize the mm -hmm. candidates, and, you mm -hmm. know, you could take them down and merge them good in a wonderful way. What is the meaning of baptism for you? Well, so far as baptism, according to what Jesus told Joan, it behooved him and Joan to fulfill all righteousness, which is baptize the people. That's why he was baptized himself, mm -hmm. you see, in order for me to fall in his footstep, mm -hmm. you see. So then emerge mean come up rise up in the newness of life. So go under the water. Go under the, that's what you and, and, and arise. Rise up in the newness of life. 
What was the most beautiful baptism scene you've seen here? Well, you know, we used to do something, my husband and I, sometimes Sister uh, Ophelia Brown, when we baptized um, her, her brother, um, Henry Brown, right in here. Now, we baptized, it wasn't just the Baptists, all who had wanted to, he was a, he had belong, belongs to Father Robert's church up there in Old Redeemer, and he had wanted to be baptized. So we, we was afflicted, and so he came in here, hopping down on that, on walking, that walking cane and like that, and when he got down here, and after we baptized him, he threw that, that kid away mm. and walked out here and going as a happy as a lock, doing fine mm. in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. But it's so beautiful. Sometimes we baptize in, in around about 10 o'clock in the morning, the Saturday morning used to be, or 3 o'clock in the evening time, you know. And then it's so beautiful because people see the people coming down, string of people be coming down to the baptism, mm -hmm. and they got the hymn book and the mm -hmm. Bible. And then we can get there and get them all straightened out and start singing the hymn. And, and oh, it's great. It's great. Carry it back. Let's move on. You said that the Europeans, the colonists, knew very little about rice farming. Would you, would you talk about that? Yes. Um, I suppose it was Martin Delaney who, the, the um, black nationalist from the 19th century and physician, an associate of Frederick Douglass, who first wrote about uh, the experience in, in, in a way at least that was accessible to, 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 to significant numbers of black intellectuals. In the 1850s, Delaney observed that um, in one of his essays, Political Destiny of, of Black People, of Colored People, that the African was responsible for teaching uh, the uh, plantation overlords the means of cultivating rice. In historical circles in recent decades, the significant work on the subject is, is Peter Wood's book, Black Majority, in which Wood uh, suggests that with the importation into South Carolina of rather sizable numbers of Africans, particularly from the area of Sierra Leone, Mendes and Tendes and so on and the like, that in the 1690s, in the colonial period, uh, it was during that decade that South Carolinians somehow hit upon the means of cultivating rice after having tried and tried and tried. These uh, Africans who were brought in from this section of, of, uh, of, of, of Africa, from Sierra Leone, came from, from regions that were, that for centuries had cultivated rice. And so the, 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 uh, the inference here in Wood's book is that uh, they were responsible basically for teaching South Carolina whites how to cultivate rice.